in my work, I'm very much fascinated by computational approach to understand human behavior, uh, which shaped the entire direction of my research and academic work so far. I've been really fascinated by the way we can understand individuals and population behavior by studying the patterns in the digital data uh, that we generate through the use of smartphones, wearable technology, um, and social networks. And uh, really, I wanted to, in this talk to give you a bit of a flavor of a very unique times that we are living in right now that give us this enormous capability to understand the reality and humans through the digital technology that they are connected to. I perceive this global adoption of smartphones and associated digital devices and services as one of the most transformative processes in our reality. All of this is about the connectivity, about the fact that we reach the point in the technological development where we can really truly take advantage of powerful, fast, uh, ubiquitous digital devices um, and the connectivity capability that they bring. And let's make no mistake here, um, we really are in the world where a lot of us are right now heavily connected individuals. There are 4.66 billion active internet users, which represents around 60% of the world population. Also, there are about 3.5 billion people with smartphones globally. That's about 45% of world population. What this enables us to do is to almost create like a digital layer, um, which in turn makes the mechanics of our physical world more efficient. We live in times when our education, travel, shopping, work, entertainment, social communication and content creation is massively empowered by the digital devices that we own and connect to. And we have also an unprecedented era of choices and options. Now, what this digital connectivity also brings is the ability to collect and use data. Um, data itself, of course, is just a tool, but this collective ability to produce and exchange it is really a game changer. Um, and it's, it's a cliche to say that everyone in the society benefits from the digital data. Governments can make better measurements of the uh, success of their programs, hopefully. And media and other non-government organization can use data to support their work and check facts. A particular case I wanted to highlight is related to a health innovation that are driven by uh, digital technology. Of course, that's just one of the cases where things are really transforming rapidly and in a very much science fiction direction. One of the experiments um, from Clayton and team that uh, they done a couple of years ago, uh, looking at this phenomenon of, phenomena of a smartphone separation. So what they did, they invited a group of participants for an experiment and uh, they asked the group to take part in a, in a simple set of cognitive tests, you know, IQ tests and so on. They told participants, well, when we'll be doing those tests, we want to measure your heart rate. Uh, so we're going to attach this heart rate monitor to, to your chest. But unfortunately, this heart rate monitor is quite sensitive to your smartphone signal. So could you just take your smartphone and leave it there on the shelf on the side so it won't interfere with the signal of the recorder of the heart rate recorder? So when participants then were taking part in this task, they were filling the, the, the tests and they weren't aware that actually that wasn't a real goal of this experiment. Um, during this process, the researchers actually called the participants so they could see that their phones started vibrating there in the shelf when they were still participating in experiments, strapped with all this gear to measure their uh, heart rate and some other uh, you know, biophysical characteristics. And what happened then? Well, their average heart rate actually increased by 10 beats per minute when they were prevented from answering the iPhones when it was just lying there on the shelf. And at the very end of the experiment, when they were finally reunited with their small uh, smartphones, their heart rate actually dropped by 13 beats per minute um, when, when they got their phones back. So I think that there is probably no better testament how much we are actually attached to our smartphones that this small anecdotal experiment done by Clayton and colleagues in 2015. Smartphones and wearables are very sophisticated technologies packed with sensors, multifunctional and connected, as I said earlier, with almost every aspect of our life. And when we add to this, this sheer number of social networks and digital services that 
connect that we are connected to with these particular platforms, it is really an um, enormous amount of data that's getting generated. Something that we refer to as digital traces, a tiny footprint of data that we as individuals leave in the daily usage of those different digital extensions that we have. Now, we know already that we can use those digital traces to profile and understand behavior of individual groups. But how specifically? Let's, let's look at a couple of examples here. A very basic sensor, accelerometer, uh, the one that's one of the most kind of traditionally occurring in smartphones and wearable technology that responds to the level of movement and was originally designed so that we could, when we invert our phone, um, the screen would react and got inverted as well, later expanded for gaming. But recently it's been in the center of any self-tracking technology in terms of tracking performance and uh, cycling activity. And in fact, it's been uh, widely used to predict whether you are sitting, walking, jogging, cycling or driving, or even what kind of public transport you are using with up to 95% accuracy. The same sensor, for example, can be also used to evaluate your quality of the sleep from just the body movement. So it's sensitive enough that if it's left somewhere on the bed and um, the right applications are activated, they can actually detect a movement of your body that is changing during the different stages of sleep that you're going through. From other different metadata and data that Swago generates, simple things like call logs, text message logs, and Bluetooth scans and application usage profiles can be used to predict personality traits with up to 70% accuracy. And further, the length of your text messages or other messages that you write and how fast you type or raise it can be used to identify your mood or a global emotional state. Stress levels can be also detected with up to 80% accuracy by capturing only a few words with a microphone. And even this is not about the meaning of the words, it's about the sound of your voice, about actually just the characteristics, the vocal characteristics of your voice, how fast you are talking, how loud, um, whether there are particular frequencies higher or lower present in your voice can really strongly indicate stress and other emotional levels. In one study by Stanford Group, they show that heart rate, skin temperature, and blood oxygen level that were recorded with simple wearable uh, device um, that can be purchased for a low cost on the consumer market could be used to identify early signs of Lyme disease, inflammatory responses, so some sort of infections, and physiological differences between insulin sensitive and insulin resistant individuals. So in this case, the researchers compared some of the signals that they got that I mentioned here from, from the wearables that the participants were wearing and also from some clinical markers that they used. And they found that actually they could only need the wearable data to make an indication that something is happening. And this is quite a powerful point here because it opens the door for what we can call as preventing preventive predictive diagnostics that will be able to capture that if something is changing in our body and or some illness or infection is developing before we actually feel that this is happening. In a similar manner, a wearable activity data in another study um, from, from group in Stanford show that wearable activity data can be used to, for cardiac imaging to de determine how the size of the heart is influenced by the physical activity and for this area called lipodomics to identify species of particular proteins that are associated with obesity, diabetes, or heart diseases. Again, in this case, the wearable activity data was compared to those cardiac imaging and tests that were done with the clinical grade devices, but they showed those really clear associations that were be between those two sources of the data. So the predictive preventing diagnostics, this emerging promise that we will be able very soon, or we already have the potential to actually take this data and use it in a constructive way to make a predictions about health conditions. And of course, another domain here is the potential for facilitating behavior change that's closely related to some sense to the diagnostic uh, capabilities of the consumer devices. 
almost 50%, 45% of risks that are attributed to the higher mortality are risks such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol level, physical inactivity or obesity. And uh, when you look at those particular conditions, it's quite clear that a lot of them could be addressed with the right behavior change interventions. And wouldn't it be great if the same technology that allegedly put us in the couches, you know, that really stimulated the sedentary lifestyle could be used to actually target such issues. Almost all of those, if they are used in the right way with the wearable technology, could be somehow addressed um, in this way. And the principle behind this, how this could be addressed, is coming from a, a quite old theories around the self-tracking and feedback. But because of this emergence of personal digital technology and the fact that the smartphone is with us continuously during the day and by our bedside during the night and is one of the first thing we grab in the morning, and the fact that there are personal devices on our wrists and other parts of the body that also take those measurements, th those theories suddenly became more real, more uh, in instant in terms of the feedback they can provide, more personalized, and also the fact that this process can be continuous, intelligent, much more detailed than some of the solutions that's been used in the past, such as uh, self-report surveys or questionnaires that, of course, require you to introspect understand the question and make some answer. While in here, there is just a stream of data that's getting evaluated by the algorithm and it infers whether there is a point where it could suggest something to you. There might be some change or that you maybe should consider uh, going to see a GP because your, your heart rate is showing some abnormal patterns or that your levels of activity dropped below the, the levels that you would like to have. You might remember it's been very large phenomena in, in 2016 and that is, that's, that's reversed to Pokemon Go when it had almost half half billion downloads and it still has about 20, 30 million active users. Over 3.6 billion in lifetime revenue that um, that uh, manufacturers or the, the developers of this solution created. Um, you might remember that the idea with the Pokemon Go with this smartphone game was that you were going around the, the real world, the actual physical world with your smartphone in front of you and you are basically just hunting and throwing those pokeballs into the small virtual monsters that were overlaid on the actual real world. So they, the, it was based on a geolocation algorithm. The gamers were just running around the cities and trying to catch those, those pokeballs. But what Microsoft researchers actually noticed in this period, that there was overall a 25% average increase in the physical activity for users who played Pokemon Go across genders, ages, weight statuses and prior research activity levels. So those factors weren't actually influencing this. So this is really kind of a nice example of almost an accidental effect of digital technology on physical activity that through gamification elevated a large number of people to actually move more, be more physically active and in or, and of course in, in re as a result contributing to their health. The, the final part of my title was the future of, of the analytics. I, I just wanted to say that the future is actually already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. By paraphrasing or, or quoting one of my favorite science fiction authors, uh, William Gibson, um, who, who said it. And really, I, I couldn't agree more. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a very unique times when technologically we have enormous capabilities, enormous amount of choices, and there are so many potential directions in how we can use this to make our and other lives better, uh, to improve the functioning of organizations, governments, uh, almost every aspect of our life uh, can could be addressed and improved with the right application and elevating this data. So. We are already living in this future, in a sense, because all those future science, those science fiction scenarios from 70s and 80s are now fulfilled in a way, and we can clearly see in which directions we are heading with some of those phenomena. Only a tiny percentage of the data that we generate is actually ever analyzed and used, and this brings this enormous potential for all of us.